You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY Musician Hey there, and welcome to episode number 87 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin, and joining me for this roundtable edition is Chris and The Bolt. Hello. Bolt. Hola. How you guys doing? I'm good. I was trying to wipe the rest of the eyeliner off yeah. my face. I was just noticing that. He, he had a glam rock show last yeah. night. Oh, glam nice. Glam rock tribute. It was, I was way more bedazzled and glittered up and last night. Cool. I don't know what this is saying, but last roundtable, you were in the middle of a, a cleanse, basically where you were starving yourself. Pretty much, yeah. This week, oh, and I should say, although you sounded great on the podcast, you looked like you were about to fall out of your chair last time. <laughs> I was time. kind of emaciated. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm getting my gut back. But <laughs> today you walk in with Taco Bell, probably the worst thing you could eat, and you look great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> great. So maybe I should and start. And you're sparkling. Yeah. You know, they have been advertising the Taco Bell diet. Yeah. Seriously. I should what? Worse yes, they that's have been. ridiculous. Anyway, this is not a food show, but it's good to <laughs> see you back in full form. <laughs> You're calling me fat. No, I'm calling... It was just... You You looked at, at uh, me last time like you'd rather be dead than sitting there podcasting, <laughs> so... <laughs> it's good to see some life. Everyone doing well? Yeah, I'm doing good. I got a show this weekend, so I'm pumped. That's nice. right. Uh, playing the the world famous Kenton Club. Of course, anyone listening to this, it'll already be have happened. But yes. uh, I am not sh- I'm not familiar with this. And world it's famous actually club. called the world famous Kenton Club, right? Isn't that part? Yeah, of its that's name? part of its name is yeah. the world famous <laughs> Kenton Club. So well, you, I'm sure you know. all of our listeners have heard of the world famous <laughs> Kenton as, Club. As long as somebody on the other side of the globe's heard of it, it's world famous. <laughs> if they weren't before, they are now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, lots of good things going on with. Um, Hello Morning and what we've been up to and uh, the last episode that we had with uh, Chris Anderson's gotten my wheels turning on a few things, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, why don't we jump into some news? CD Baby. CD Baby. Music. Music. News. 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 Well, YouTube is reaching out to indie artists through their Musicians Wanted program, where they are encouraging indie artists to sign up to be a YouTube partner. Artists who qualify will gain revenue opportunities for their videos on YouTube. Plus, they will also make money when their YouTube videos are embedded on external websites, including music blogs. They don't specifically state the viewership your videos must reach to qualify, but I've heard from an unofficial source that is in the tens of thousands. This is definitely a good development for the indie music community as it underscores the idea of how important YouTube is becoming for music promotion. Major record label Universal Music Group plans to test a new pricing scheme for CDs this year that will see discs priced between $6 and $10 at retailers. The Velocity program, as they are calling it, will see most new releases from Universal artists sold at the discounted prices. Universal also plans to increase production of deluxe album releases at higher price points. Lastly, social networking giant Facebook overtook Google's search engine page this week to become the most visited website in the U.S. According to research from website statistic firm Hitwise, Facebook edged out Google by 0.4% after almost tripling in unique visitors from the past year. Wow. Those are some... Those are the news items I saw that I thought were worthy of passing along. Interesting stuff. The YouTube thing is pretty cool. Uh, I don't really think it's anything new. I think they're just kind of branding their current partnership program uh, to encourage artists to sign up just because a lot of artists don't know about it and it was more um, something they uh, catered to like big content providers. And the person I talked to, and this could have changed may not be official or, you know, I don't know what Google's doing, but it was 100,000 was like if when your viewership reached that, then they they were automatically like sending people letters saying, hey, um, check this out, you mm-hmm. know. 
And if you go to youtube.com musicians wanted, you'll see a video from um, a CD baby artist, Pomplamoose, uh, who's gotten, I think, millions of views for some of their creative videos where they do cover songs. All the single ladies. Yes. The single. <laughs> yes. And so uh, I'm planning on uh, asking them to be on the podcast because they've done a lot of cool stuff with video and hoping to get more uh, stuff on, about YouTube and opportunities that are there. The key um, to YouTube success is to have a cute girl in the band. Yes. That's what's worked so well for them. And, and so far, it still seems to be cover songs. Either cover songs or some sort of unique thing happening in your video. They're good, too. Yes. But they're good, and they're doing cover songs, and they have a cute girl. Yes. Is that why you're wearing makeup? He's, See, I'm catching yeah, he's catching up. <laughs> the beard will soon it's be gone. It's going to be a wig next week. <laughs> it's funny, because the, sh- the glam rock show we played was actually opening for Hedwig in the Angry Inch movie, which is, you know... Oh yeah, cross dressing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Interesting. Turning over a new leaf. Yeah, mm-hmm. <clears throat> put it on YouTube. But I, I'm kind of excited because tomorrow, assuming my wife does not go into labor, which it's Sunday is her due date. By the time you hear this, hopefully, I will have a new baby. Um, Congratulations! But uh, thank you. Tomorrow, uh, we're filming a stop motion video for Hello Morning. Uh, ben, the other guitar player in the band, his brother in law is one of the lead animators at Leica that did Coraline, and he works Uh in a commercial division, and he worked on Coraline and is slated to work on one of their next big movies, And but he does a lot of the commercials, and he's been uh, planning for a long time to do a music video for us, and the concept for it sounds really cool, and I'm excited because it could be one of those things that gets some attention on YouTube, at least in a small um, amount of attention, you know? So we'll see. I'm excited. We'll see if it even ends up getting finished. The (laughs) lesson from that being befriend animators exactly yep. use the people you know <laughs> that's the music business <laughs> uh universal finally dropping their prices it's about time especially since cd manufacturing costs have been plummeting uh over the years i know there's uh, royalty issues and stuff involved that make them hesitant but uh it'd be interesting to see how that does for them and, and maybe encourages them to do a little better job of providing premium physical goods which i think uh, will do much better and people will still gladly buy. And uh, Facebook, yeah, they're big. I'm, I'm sure that might have just been a fluke. We'll see. That, yeah. was, that was for this past week, which was the third week in March, second well, fa- week in March. You know, the thing is, is Facebook has kind of combined social networking and email because people kind of use it for email and checking in. And I, they're talking like Google homepage versus Facebook. It would almost be more fair if they combined Gmail and Google homepage. Yeah, and, you know, it, well, it was just the most used website. Right. So, I mean, that's just the most visited website. The thing where it comes into play is, you know, Google just launched Buzz. Right. And um, I don't hear much Buzz about it. No. Nope. And uh, um, also because they both kind of compete in the uh, web ad space. Right. And so that's where um, things get interesting for those two. But we'll see. This yeah. is just a curiosity, but when they're counting the Google hits, or you, you know, uh, are they counting the little uh, top right hand Safari and Firefox? I doubt it. I, this is, it said their homepage, so it's people typing in Google or going to Google. So same with Facebook, it probably doesn't count because I've got like my band page bookmarked, so I don't go to the homepage of Facebook to see it. And same with the CD Baby page, I help right. manage. And so. you know, I I don't know, if, I I don't think we've asked this yet, but. Is anyone out there using Google Buzz? Like, has anyone had any success with Google Buzz? That's true. We should, if you have been using it, because when we talked about it, it was brand new, and I don't even think they'd rolled it out to all the users. But if you're using Google Buzz and think it's something useful for uh, promoting your music, uh, let us know. It'd be interesting to hear about it. I do like the way it displays videos and photos. I think that's mm-hmm. very cool. It's just, I don't find it as, I, the way it's laid out, I don't find it as useful, but... Um, we'll see. Well, we've got uh, a lot of feedback um, from you guys. I really appreciate all the phone calls. In fact, we've had so many phone calls, and this was even before the episode with Chris Anderson, which I figured there'd be a, quite a bit of reaction to, um, that uh, we're thinking about uh, maybe the next episode or one coming up quickly, just doing a listener feedback episode because there were so many good calls and a lot of them I was not able to fit into this episode, but I want to use them. So if you called in and uh, left a good message and uh, we didn't use your call this week, um, don't worry. We're going to try and get them in in the next couple episodes. 
that being said, let's get into uh, our recap for this episode. We're going to talk for a minute, but I've gotta, I, I mentioned the phone calls because we're going to use a call from someone from Germany. Uh, his name's Eli, and he left a, a, a long message, normally longer than I'd play, but it was just good stuff. So I thought after we toss around a couple ideas, we'll listen to that and then uh, kind of key off that for the rest of the conversation. So what did you guys think about the episode with Chris Anderson and uh, Free the Future of... The Future of a Radical Price. Radical Price, Price. that's right. I personally believe that Free is a marketing tool. It's a marketing tool for all and any kind of product or business. And it's been around since the beginning of commerce. I... I think that we make kind of a big deal out of it because of digital digital rights and, and MP3s and all this stuff is kind of new. But even the point that he made that, you know, look, we were giving away music on the radio, you know, why is it such a big deal now? And I, that's kind of how I feel. I, I think that, like, you know, people give away their product for free in order to promote themselves. You yeah. know, like you see people giving away Red Bulls on the corner or people giving away you know, free concert tickets or whatever in order to expose people to their product. And I think that it's not a debate of like, should it be free or should it not be free? It just, the fact is that giving away music for free is a promotional device and you can use it or you, or, or, or not. But if you're going to do promotion, you have to give something to get something. For me, the episode left me uh, confused and conflicted and very angry not at yeah. uh, any of the ideas on either side of the, the position, but just because I don't know where where my own opinion is in relation to it. Like, um, as, as an artist, as much as I would love to be paid for my music, there's also the undeniable fact that the laws of supply and demand necessitate that music be free now. There's so much of it that music is essentially worthless. It's not emotionally worthless, but as a commodity, you know, if you had the choice of two cakes someone could say yeah i'm going to charge you eight bucks for this one and nine bucks for this one and you taste them and you say oh the eight one eight dollar one's pretty good i'll buy the eight dollar one well now there's a million cakes in front of you you can't charge eight bucks anymore you got to charge 10 cents or nothing and i see where you're coming from that or with that statement i don't completely agree with that i you know i felt myself being conflicted as well because i actually have been working my way through his audio book. I'm like three-fourths of the way through, and there's a lot more detail in there. It's definitely worth listening to um, because he goes through some more specific points about how certain businesses have used it. And it's the thing to me that it comes down to is that giving away music now, I kind of see it as a substitute for what radio was in the past. And like uh, Bolton was mentioning, it's a great tool, the promotional tool. I think where people get upset is that, you know, with radio, you listen and you move on. Right. Um, where with MP3s, uh, people now have what they need and can keep passing it on. They can listen to it when they want to. I mean, people could always tape record the radio, too. I guess it was just a little bit more difficult, so there was a little bit more of, of a reason for people not to sit around and, and record everything that comes on the radio. But, but I, mean, I used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but then what We've would happen is but you'd only hear the beginning of the song and then you press record yeah, and you miss the beginning. Yeah. And, yeah. But, I, you know, that kind of goes back to an episode where I had Nancy Baim on and we talked about online fandom. And uh, to me, you know, that era, what you were cultivating was like really rabid fans where I think now the issue I have with free stuff is you're doing the exact opposite. And there's, like Chris is saying, there's so much supply that there's not that rabid fan mentality. Or it has to be cultivated differently. I'm not sure where I fall down, fall and, on the issue because um, I'm, you know, with Hello Morning, we're giving away free stuff. If you go to hellomorningband.com and you can sign up on our email list and get a free download off our new EP. And it seems to be working well. But at the same time, we've tried giving away free stuff at our shows and a, like a download card and sometimes it's worked and sometimes uh, no one's redeemed them you know so it's like that's to me the issue is like making sure that people still assign value to it but at the same time uh, you know in the interview he's saying or there's a quote here and then after this we'll get into the, the call from Eli from Germany but uh, free forsakes revenues for the potential of mass sampling. And that's uh, one of the quotes out of his book. That wasn't Chris Anderson, but that was somebody he quotes in his book. I forget the person, but that 
to me is kind of the objective where we're at is we want mass sampling, but it's, you know, limited opportunities to get in front of people. You want to make sure that sampling happens. Well, the point about radio being free, it's free to the consumer or the listener, but the, or, well, maybe not the artist, but the publisher and the songwriter was generally paid for radio plays mm-hmm. through their performance royalties. So the artist was still making money with giving out free MP3s that then get passed on for all eternity without you having any way of tracking it. There's nothing for you except yeah. exposure and the potential that these people like your music or the potential yeah. that they like it and then they just download the next band's thing. Yeah. Forget right. about you. Yeah. Well, let's uh, get into the call from Eli from Germany because uh, he, he lays out some good points as well. And we'll discuss further. Hi, this is Eli Salzman. I'm a singer-songwriter Skyping all the way from Berlin, Germany, so I hope you can hear me. Um, I've got a couple of records with CD Baby. Uh, One of them, Baby Flame, is the most recent. And um, I'm addicted to your podcast right now. It's it's really reprogramming my, my musical brain. And um, the interview with Chris Anderson really, it seemed to be kind of a keystone episode, if you will. Um, I'm sure you would agree. I I love especially that whole quote of obscurity being a bigger problem than piracy. And uh, I'm starting to really jump on board by by giving away a track almost every time I email an update to my fans. Um, I guess I just want to underline the point you, you guys were making about striking a balance with the whole free music thing, because it's a complex issue, and and I think we need to keep asking questions and coming up with new ideas, because it's such a strange time of growing pains around the whole music industry. Um, And and I think that you really do, you want to read the current download trends and the current download mentality with a certain amount of creative strategy. And I think that's the kind of key thing here, because Piracy, yes, is better than obscurity in some ways, but avoiding extinction is, is better than both, you know, um, because you, you have to admit that some of the free music mentality these days is kind of taking the value of the musician's hard work for granted. Um, I mean, especially really talented people who actually shape that talent with years and years of training and touring. Um, the reason why they're a bit miffed is, is maybe pretty obvious, um, you know, like when they see, for example, lawyers, maybe a bad example, but say they see lawyers putting in maybe half the time uh, of education and training and then making a hundred times the money while the musician is sitting at home, home unable to pay his rent. And so I think people are, are so used to music being free these days that really it's gone too far in some cases. And this is why being clever and strategic, with transparency, of course, can, can maybe help turn the tides of the more damaging end of, of the free music spectrum. I, that's just kind of my point. It's like, it's important reasons why people are angry, and it's because they're, they are not able to pay their rent, you know, and it's frustrating when you've been training since you were 12, you know, so for some people. And, um, and one way that this can be done, by the way, I, this strategic, you know, uh, addressing this, the free music thing in a strategic way, um, it's been talked about a bunch, of course, already, is, is not underselling your live show tickets. Um, and this is a problem here in Berlin, uh, where there, by the way, there are a ton of new young American musician expats moving to Berlin right now. But uh, anyways, in Berlin and also in some other markets in the U.S. and in Europe, I've seen where people are doing free shows because they think it's a great opportunity for exposure, and then they're charging too much for their CDs. And from the perspective of this whole podcast, right, that's a little ass backwards. Um, we we got to be kind of smarter and more innovative and about this type of stuff. And don't be shy to at least charge a five spot for your show is what I think, you know. So... I think that this, I'm probably repeating what a bunch of people are saying, but I think that the main point of of that balance and being innovative and creative with giving away free music so that you can address the issue of, you know, people pirating so much that people don't have a living, you know, so so there's sort of a a scale to look at both of those sides of that, I think. Um, Anyways, thanks for everything, Kevin. You totally rock, man. 
even over here in uh, the poorest yet sexiest city in Europe, you're, you're, um, you're making us shine over here. So thanks a lot, and thanks for listening. Thanks for the call, Eli. The poorest but sexiest city in Europe. I did not know that. I've never been to Berlin. I hope to make it sometime. My family's line is from Cologne, Germany. Little does he know that he's listening to the poorest but sexiest room <laughs> yeah. in, <CDM>. yeah. <laughs> in the music business. The poorest but yeah. sexiest. <laughs> That's right. Oh, if they could see behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah. no, I thought, th- thought there was a lot of good things in that call. What did you think? You, you look like you had Oh, no. Th- his call along with this whole discussion leads me to this. Um, again, it's a conflicted feeling of hope and fear that if, if you remove the rewards of making music... Uh, the, the monetary rewards, I suppose. Uh, what are you left with? You're left with an infinite population of people who can make music and then do it solely for the love of it, which is this kind of beautiful, pure thing. But then I'm also conflicted because I don't think the people who love making music that are necessarily the people that are making the best music. So I don't know where we start reintroducing the... The stoppers. The gatekeepers. The gatekeeper. There can't be just this endless flood of crap. <laughs> right. You know, like, somebody please just... Look out that window, Chris. I know. We have a warehouse full of wonderful, beautiful, expressive music. Very, yeah. Diverse. But you know Diverse. What, I'll so, keep my mouth shut yeah. on that. So much of the music... I mean, I think that people are still riding the dream. They're still... Maybe not this generation of young people, but definitely every generation up until now, you know, since recorded music was possible, people had this sort of starry version of what could be accomplished. And I think that, like, that dream is not going to exist in the same way. Well, I think, you know, what you're saying, the dream does not exist in the same way. Before, people were shooting for, like, the moon and becoming a star and, yeah. and being the big the big label artist and you know that there were so many obstacles in the way that once you hit too many of them you quit you got out of the way (laughs) you just you said you know what we can't record because it's too expensive we can't tour because it's too expensive blah 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 we give up because we're i guess we're not that good we're not getting noticed we're not getting signed we've been at it for 10 years we're going to quit now now there's no reason for anyone to quit they can just sit in their basement (laughs) Twiddle their knobs. That's and not that's a euphemism. Perfectly twiddle their knobs. Chris, our listeners may have liked you better on the the, the cleanse. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting fired up. But. You are. You're like all red. You're like I'm. I'm expecting to march out of here. No, but people, the, the, please the, stop me. No, don't listen to Chris. <laughs> um, you know he that gets mentioned. You know, uh, and Eli's called it piracy is better than obscurity, but it's not. You know, extinction is not the, the answer either. But I would say that there's a wake up call, a different wake up call than what you're saying. I'm not saying stop making music, but I'm saying where's this idea that people ever made a living off of music in the in the first in the place? First place. Right. right. So I mean, I, when I went to college to study music, my uncle specifically told me I was making a mistake <laughs> and I was going to be broke the rest of my life. He was right, but let's just say that you know there was the understanding that uh, that it was going to be a big challenge. I mean, only the cream of the crop was able to make money. I don't think anything's changed. I think more people that aren't the cream of the crop, which I'm perfectly, I'm probably one of those people that's not the cream of the crop, is now able to make some money, but not necessarily a living. And I think those are the people that are probably the most upset because you've got the idea of superstars and then everybody else. And in the past, it was just the superstars. And if you were somebody else, you got dropped off your label. But now you have the superstars that are the ones that can still, you know, command money in some form or fashion. And then everyone else feels like the the market is trending so that nobody thinks there's value in anything that's not superstar status. That's my opinion. I don't know for what it's worth. I guess if you previously, if you were the cream of the crop, you rose to this place where you were lucky enough to have your label steal from you. <laughs> so you probably See, weren't making money at that point. Hey, either. If, you're not, if you're not, if as Robert Lee King would say, it it should be about the art, Chris. <laughs> it shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, he hated this episode, and we'll probably, I mean, the previous one, and we'll probably hate this one too. So. <laughs> I just think it's this this place where. 
you got to understand that there are lots of opportunities to make money with music. There's more opportunities to get creative with your music. And I think, you know, like the episode where, uh, past episode where we talked about, you know, uh, partnering with companies and, and such. Um, there's great opportunity there. There's great opportunity in music licensing, all that will pay money. And even outside of, uh, you know, like the big licensing placement, you know, on uh, primetime television or a big movie, I've got a, a past indie album signed up with a company that's based here in town called Rumblefish, and they struck up a deal with YouTube, and I've been getting consistent checks of, you know, 300 bucks the past well, couple quarters ago, just off with that. just off of with their deal with YouTube where you can people can upload videos and it'll erase whatever audio they have and you can they can scroll through this library and find a song and so I mean it's not a living but it's like those are kind of income streams that are available that weren't before yeah. and and um, that weren't album sales it's just one of those things where where people need to be is just kind of like uh, Eli was saying, strategic, kind of have a better understanding of what's going on, what how people are engaging with music, and you got to be there first, you know? Like for you, Chris, this is a conversation you and I had the other day, and I think you should be doing, um, you have a vast catalog. In the past, artists would sit on old CDs in their basement or... Um, you know, just stop promoting those albums. They're basically dead albums. But for you, I think, you know, you got several new albums recorded, probably five or six Not at this several. point. <laughs> I, have, I have one that's ready to go. Um, yeah. But anyway, I, you know, you, in my opinion, those albums that you're no longer promoting, they're still albums that were good work, but I would be giving those away and um, making them available for free download or giving away the CDs that it shows or... Like another idea you and I were discussing, you're going to a story at a play a show. You know, it's kind of like we were talking about it's this off town. Off the beaten path. Yeah, off the beaten town. path. And it's this town that's got a, a kind of revitalizing arts culture, but it's not proven as a place to worthwhile driving two hours to play a show. So we were t- discussing the idea of him going there like a week early and giving out some of his older albums for free to get people engaged with the music. Then when the new album comes out, you know, you sell that to them. Right. So, I mean, I think that's one idea that... Um, as you build a catalog that's worthwhile and also just having a, a plan with, you know, what you're trying to get out of it. If you don't want anything out of it, then who cares what you do with it, you know? I mean, the, th- the thing is, is that people are not going to stop paying for entertainment. And if there's a ton of entertainers in a certain genre, it's going to be harder for you to, you know, make money in that genre. And, you know, you have to be creative. You have to find your own space. You have to create you know, maybe create your own market or whatever it is you have to bend over backwards to do to make money in the entertainment business. Um, it's always been tough. It's always been tough for, for not just musicians, but actors and painters. And- Any creative. I mean, that's one thing when I was uh, going through some of the feedback for this episode. I mean, think about if you're a painter, how pissed you must be because with all the tools graphic artists have, I mean, they can basically whip together something that looks just as good as what you do. Right. And or, or, you know, people are always talking about music being stolen and downloaded and all this stuff, but there's also text, books, blogs. You know, people are constantly posting, you know, writers who, you know, maybe are, are selling their articles are seeing less and less return on their work as well because of digitization of uh, text and stuff. Mm-hmm. But again, the ones who are creative, the ones that are able to create value and, and, uh, and need for their work are able to make make some dough still. I think that uh, the frustrated artists among us kind of have a little revisionist history of the good old days or something. But there were like no. you said, yeah, before there never were any good old days. Our artists have always struggled, and we always will. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but just in different ways. I think you know, just because you know, it, people may see the value of MP3s is less. Which I don't think is widespread. I, I I shouldn't say not widespread, but I think people aren't necessarily paying for the content in most cases. Like when in Chris's interview, he was talking about how kids have time, but they don't have money. You know, and adults have money, 
in no time. You know, as you get older in life, you have less and less time. And he also made a good point about, you know, he's in his 40s and he's buying a lot more music and staying more up to date than probably his generation would have been in past years. You know, I, I when I don't remember growing up many 40-year-olds being that engaged with music, but now that's common and that, you know, music consumption's at an all-time high. So where there's maybe a segment of culture that's seen MP3s as just free consumable ideas, there's more and more people than ever that are probably willing to pay if you, you know, get in front of their face and provide the need. And especially they're not just paying, you know, they're not just paying because they think music has value. They're paying because, you know, they want it to go seamlessly to their iPod or... Yeah, the convenience factor. I thought that was really... I mean, I you know, I thought that, but he put it, put it really clearly. And I was thinking about the last time I bought music. I mean, people indie artists, they put up MP3s on blogs and stuff like that all the time. You know, Amazon has a huge catalog of free MP3s that you can download. There's tons of free music out there that you can get legally if you want to spend the time doing it. Like the other day, I was just, I just need some music to 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 listen to like when I'm exercising and I went to iTunes and they had all these great recommendations. I found like four albums and I bought them all. You know, like I could have also spent a little bit more time and found free music that could have served my purpose because of the convenience and how easily iTunes just syncs with my iPod. I just, you know, I spent the the 30, 40 bucks. You know, maybe when I was younger, I would have been a little more creative because I didn't have the 30 or 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. And and there's a big segment of people that also buy because they want to support the artist. And they know a lot of the people, even before digital music was the norm, a lot of people shopped at CD Baby because they knew the artists got more of the money. I right. mean, that was one of the biggest reasons people would come here that were just out of, you know, shopping for new music. They wanted to support the artists. And I think that is going to be, um, you know, something that is a motivating factor, maybe even more so in coming years that they want to make sure that these artists can keep making art that they enjoy. And I think that's where it's upon the artist community to develop that relationship in a way where they care, you know? There's a local artist, uh, Holcomb Waller is a folk, kind of mixes folk and performance art, but he um, has done that thing where he's basically asking fans to pay for his album in advance so he can have a recording fund. And he's done a really good job of playing it up so his fans feel like patrons, you know, and and they're... um, I think he has like a minimum asking price or something, but he's found that um, a lot of people will give way more than that. Just yeah, out of generosity. I'm doing that. I'm doing that right now with my band, and uh, I did sort of three price points um, for the album that's not made yet. One's ten, one's twenty, and one's forty dollars. And surprisingly, a lot of people have been paying the forty dollars just because they want to support the effort. Which, in a way, it's so funny because it totally circumvents the idea of like having an unlimited amount of digitally reproducible mp3s because people are paying for the product before it exists with the idea that if they don't pay for it it may not exist at all right right <laughs> yeah. huh. that's a good point are you using a kickstarter is that the website no i'm just hey, using just a paypal, PayPal button PayPal. yeah PayPal. paypal button on my site we've got i set a two thousand dollar goal and we're uh, a little bit over four hundred dollars right now mm-hmm. but um but it's yeah, just get like a sale or two a week, and you just bug your friends and buddies, and <laughs> <laughs> until they start defriending you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or they they just pay you, so you'll leave them alone. <laughs> or do you have real friends? I only have Facebook. I, I, friends. I have a few. Yeah, I think I think he does have Pretty real sure. friends. I think one, one another good point that Eli made in his call was about artists discounting their live show or not charging a cover charge in order to you know, get people there to try and sell them a CD for 15 bucks or something, you know, along those lines. And I think it's a a good point of, I think, you know, people are more in the mentality that when I go out to a show, I'm going to pay to get in. So charge a cover charge, you know, five bucks is nothing. They're going to spend that in one beer, you know. So I think trying to figure out where those boundaries are where people you know is 10 bucks too much in most cases i would say unless you got a good solid bill it probably is but yeah. you know five bucks at the door you know a free show isn't necessarily a draw because people are kind of in the mentality that they're going to pay for a show 
And I don't know. To me, it comes back to a lot of this comes back to um, I've got another quote here from uh, that was in Chris Anderson's book. Advertisers think consumers who pay are more valuable. They have made an emotional and financial commitment. They want the product and will treasure it. I think this is a big sticking point for artists where they may have uh, been able to get their music into more people's hands, but ultimately they care less. Uh, that second part was me. I just was reading it, so it sounded like part of the quote. <laughs> um, to me, that's part of the issue, like I said, where some of the free stuff we've given away, it doesn't. it's not a matter of they got the music for free. It's like they got something for free and then didn't listen. Right. I want them to listen. I think the music's good enough that if they listen, they'll like it. I think that making it personal is what, I mean, if you're going to give something away, you do have to make it personal. You have to be like, this is, I'm giving this to you. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not, this is because I value you and this is a special gift that has value to me, you know, like mm-hmm. you have to make that sort of bond between yourself and the fans so that they don't just think you're just handing out, you know, yeah. free suckers at the, at the <laughs> concert or whatever. And, uh, Ryan wines, good friend of ours, who's been on the podcast a couple of times. He, it's, it's kind of interesting. I need to talk to him again and uh, see if he's changed his opinion, but, uh, he used to, he says like with, you know, a lot of artists might give away download cards, but he thinks it's important to like charge a dollar. So there's that some sort of financial commitment that they go home and, and actually get it, but well, you could do the same thing with a contest, you know, or you could do the same thing if they pay the five dollar cover charge, then they get a free download card. So rather than rather than giving them away at the table and putting a stack there and being just grab one if you want one, you're as you walk into the venue, you put down five dollars and they hand you a download card, and then it has more value. Mm-hmm. Got to make them come to you. That's right. <laughs> I think ultimately, what artists struggle with. This is like the big, big picture what they struggle with is then back in the, in the day. No. Well, that, but that, that's what the music, Organizational that's, that's skills. how the good music comes about. <laughs> Drinking problems. <laughs> all, all of the above, but that's just how you make good art. Um, back in the day when, you know, there was this dream of being one of the chosen few to actually get to make a good record in a good studio. Um, if you were one of the chosen few, you didn't really have to do much as far as on the business side and now people were getting people were getting screwed and you know the artists that were business savvy ended up you know being able to have some longevity or if if someone came and took them under their wing and you know made sure that someone looked out for them but now that's in the artist court because no one's going to care enough about individual artists in most cases to do all that for them unless there's already a big income stream you know major labels aren't picking artists out of the blue that they believe in that because they have great art you know it's artists like you know i fight dragons that have sold four thousand cds tons of downloads and have a massive mailing list and already booking big tours on their own successful tours without a label those are the guys getting deals so i think that's where most artists get the the point of frust- frustration really hinges on that is that i have to do more now than i want to and i just wanted to play my music well and that people love and get paid for it. And to me, that's the big sticking point. And so all this other stuff is just stuff that they have to pay attention to that they didn't have to before. Personally, for me, I like doing most aspects of running my own music career. I like booking. I like writing songs. I like practicing. I like, I designed my website, not very well, but I designed it. Mm -hmm. Like, all the different stuff. I like doing all of it. I just don't like doing all of it at once. And yeah. so for me, it's been very helpful lately to get other people involved who can just take on little projects that will take things off my hands so I can say. All right, I, I know. I have nine people in my band. i got to put some of those guys put to them work. To work. <laughs> I finally got my band working. It's been great. I can like just book a tour or just work on the website and not feel like I'm juggling like 13 things at once. Yeah, it's tough. Now that I have the I have the whole recorded album at home and I'm trying to do the website and I'm trying to manage practices and I'm trying to get the artwork figured out and, you know. What do they do? Delegate. I know, I know, I got to do it. Well, we've got some uh, more listener feedback that we need to get into, so let's do that now. What's up, CD Baby Crew? This is Randy. I'm out in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, I got a group called the Quest Poetics, and I'm calling about the Chris Anderson interview, all about free. 
Um, I actually left you an email um, regarding like everything that I've done with the screencast, showing you all that I've set up. However, I must say that I couldn't agree more with what Chris Anderson was saying, and it's pretty crazy that people would actually be offended that 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 he would suggest that you offer things up for free. Um, I know in my uh, in my experience, the last year I've set things up since I was listening. I started listening about last year. About a year ago, uh, listening, and I heard an interview with Ariel from Ariel Publicity, and she inspired me to do a bunch of things. Bought her book, all because of the CD Baby podcast. Since then, I've I've generated a podcast uh, network of about 250,000 subscribers, an email list in the last year that's grown to about 11,000 people from all over the world. Uh, and how did I do that? By giving away free stuff. Now, did everyone buy? No but I did have a percentage of those people that signed up for free things they ended up buying, whether it was uh, guitar lessons, whether it was beats, whether it was my band's album, whether it was this, whether it was that. Quite frankly, I wouldn't have gotten those 10,000 emails had I not been giving away free guitar lessons. That's what I do. I, I do guitar lessons online of covers, and then I tell them if they want more, then go to my website and you can sign up for free video guitar lessons email to your address, and that's why they signed up. They signed up for guitar lessons, but within those guitar lessons, I then teach my own songs, not covers. I teach them off my album, and right underneath the lesson, right there, boom, by the CD, QuestPoetics.com. I'm always saying it. It's worked for me, and I could not agree with him more, and I'm just, it's crazy that people would be offended that he suggests free, and they get offended. Honestly, to me, it's insanity, but uh, it, it works for me, and if you want to hear more about it, contact me, questpoetics.com. If you want to check out what I'm doing, sign up to my lesson, see how I do it. It works. Anyway, peace. This is Randy from Vancouver, British Columbia with the Quest Poetics out. Thank you. And I liked that idea that he, you know, there's a perfect example of how he's doing it and pulling it off effectively and you know, giving somebody a teaser that's not his music, and then when he does the lesson, it's his songs, and they have to learn his songs, and then they're like, hey, I'll check out the album. That is a pretty smart... <laughs> yeah, apparently it's working. <laughs> pretty smart deal he's got going there. <laughs> so see, you just... See, Chris, you just got to think outside the box. So. <laughs> it's not about records on a record store shelf anymore. It's, see if you can... That's con- just part of the equation. Convince thousands of people all over the world to learn your songs. <laughs> You could easily Genius. you could easily do a bunch of Beatles guitar lessons or Beatles piano lessons or something and then little do they know they're going to get the Robley experience. <laughs> this is a Beatles song you may not have heard before. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my album. Uh, it's by the fifth Beatle named Chris Robley. Uh, he released a couple albums, check it out. No, I thought it was a good idea. Um and uh, somebody should uh, try it and uh, see if they can do something similar. But uh, we got one more call. Hey, Kevin um, uh, Bolton and Chris. I was going to say Kevin Bacon. <laughs> um, hey, guys. Uh, this is Carl Kuhn. Um, I am calling uh, about the last two uh, most recent episodes. I'll keep this short. Um, the I Fight Dragons episode I really enjoyed. Um, I've heard a lot of not-so-positive comments about it. Um, but I really enjoy it. I think I had a lot of good information on how to uh, uh, specifically apply a lot of good ideas uh, to your shows to, to get groups uh, or to get, uh, to get fans. Um, I get surprised in terms of how many uh, comments I've heard about the type of music that they did, um, but not really focusing on uh, the, the actions they did um, to get their fans. Uh, so uh, that's a comment about that. Um, uh, secondly, uh, the partnership. Uh, episode I really enjoyed as well. Um, for those who have less mainstream sound, I would think that uh, you know there's a lot of uh, uh, sports and extreme sports that look for more aggressive sounds. And uh, you know there's like um, skate parks and, and skating events, or if you're on the coast surfing. And uh, if you go to one of these companies or shops, you can say, hey, you know, um, my music is geared to this. People like aggressiveness. Um, they like you know four-letter expletives in their songs sometimes. You know, I can cut it out, you know, and you can put parental advisory in your mailing list, um, you know, with an offer to, for my full album or whatever. But, you know, there's there's ways to go like that. So, uh, yeah, uh, love the podcast. Long time listener, first time caller. Um, I'm at carl Kuhn, K A R L Kuhn dot com. Um, you'll see my coming soon page. Um, but don't go if you don't like diatonic chords and major chords. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Did he say, "Don't go 
if you don't, don't like, like yeah okay i think he was being funny because of the fact that uh um about i fight dragons about you know their music's too simple or something yeah i don't know yeah did but, he say something about kevin bacon he said he almost said kevin bacon when he, when he <laughs> <laughs> Why so, is Kevin Bacon always funny? Hey, Carl, I appreciate the call. Um, yeah, I liked the I Fight Dragons episode, and a lot of people did. And um, there was just a few that commented about the music, but that wasn't the point, really. So, so yeah, thanks for the, the calls. And I've got a couple comments. Ronnie commented that uh, he's been giving away free offerings on his website for a couple years now. And I'm sure it has not helped sell any CDs, but obscurity is worse than not selling CDs. Problem is that I suffer from both. <laughs> Poor Ronnie. Not not anymore. That's right. <laughs> Ronnie, you are famous, world famous. <laughs> We've got listeners in Germany. That's right. So that, that counts as the world. We've got listeners in Australia, all sorts of places. I know we got some in Canada. That's right. And uh, another comment uh, from Rob who said, unfortunately, I didn't learn about the abridged audiobook version until I sat through the seven-hour unabridged audiobook. But despite being ridiculously long, the book was very a very fascinating listen. I'm already a huge supporter of free as a price, and I offer all my music, the Bits versions, for free with no strings attached. Maybe someday I will implement some kind of freemium model with physical products, but the digital incarnation will always be free. So that's another opinion from Rob. I know many people will not agree with that and some will and uh you know i think again if you're interested in some ideas that are out there how people are using free as a way to motivate audience or gain exposure i really suggest you check out the audiobook because there's so much in there the audiobook of uh you know chris anderson free the future of a radical price it is a free download and there's links to it on the podcast website and uh, there's so much stuff in there that it's not just about making everything the price zero. That's not it at all. It's the idea of, you know, you're trying to expand your audience. So one of the best ways to do it is to get a lot of your content in people's hands. And then the more content you have in people's hands, you know, you're going to a smaller percentage of those people will actually pay for things. And the more the, you know, just increasing that, content or that pool of people that are engaging in your content is the the best way to get a larger percentage of people paying for content and, and if so, you and if you want to give away free music and protect it what i would recommend is like about 30 seconds into the into the track or maybe every 30 seconds while you're listening to the track just have a really loud like <laughs> 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 or no no just like it, it goes silent for a second Cheapskate. <laughs> and then it keeps going. <laughs> Loser. <laughs> That's a weird artistic choice they made. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, check out the book. There's lots of good ideas in there. And it's not just about, oh, I can't charge anything anymore. And, and, and uh, Chris was quick to correct me in the interview when I kind of set it up that way. There's good ideas in the book that I've been kind of racking my brain. Okay, how do I implement this with Hello Morning. And, and, he, and he did point out that he's doing the same thing with his book. He's given away free versions and paid ver- paid versions. Yep. And it wasn't perfect either. That was what was uh, even better about the example that, you know, it wasn't like the guy who wrote the book did it all perfectly and we're all sitting, sitting there screwed. It was like he found some challenges with it as well. So anyway, if you'd like to call our listener line, the number is 206 426 Five six eight three. You can email us at info at cdbabypodcast.com and you can post a comment on the podcast site under the show notes for whichever episode you want to um, weigh in on or leave some hate messages for us. <laughs> <laughs> it was all Chris, I promise. <laughs> um, you can do that at, I at think, CD I Baby. I think people are going to agree with me on this episode. cdbabypodcast.com. I, I'd like to see. Yeah, They're on we'll my see. side. They, they probably are. We'll see. So, uh, Unless you guys have any final comments. Just one. (laughs) (laughs) Cheap skates. Well. I apologize for their behavior. (laughs) Don't pirate this podcast. I'm eating food again. (laughs) This is eating food. He's he's, he's on a sugar high for the last three days. I am the (laughs) bolt. All right. If anyone's still listening, we'll catch you next time.